Uh, I'm a privacy designer, um, and I wrote a little book about that called Design My Privacy. That's used in a lot of schools in the Netherlands to teach privacy design. Um, but more importantly, I'm a technology critic, which means that I try to not believe everything that Silicon Valley tells us um, face value. Um, I also work for the Ministry of Technology and Innovation in the Netherlands, which doesn't exist, but the website does. <laughs> um, the main question I, I work with in technology is, how do I get a wider audience to understand what's going on and to care about it? Um, and one of the places I do that is, is Setup, which is a, I'm a co-founder of this, this media lab, this cultural organization in, in Utrecht here in the Netherlands. Um, and we do funding projects. We're a non-profit. Um, and what we do a lot is we use humor to explain things, use humor to reach a wider audience to help them understand what's going on. So we do a lot of crazy projects. Um, but I won't really go into those, I'm afraid. Um, but what this talk is going to, going to be about is what does it mean to be free when surveillance is a dominant business model of the internet? Um, I think uh, it starts with this button that a lot of us click all the time. And we, I agree button. We don't really know what we're uh, agreeing to. And what I'm interested in is what is the long term, you know, what happens in the long term if we keep clicking all these buttons all the time? And I believe in the long term we could see the rise of something that I call social cooling, uh, which is a purposeful connection to global warming, and I'll get to that later. Um, the core idea is that we change our behavior a lot and that we start to uh, yeah, apply more self-censorship. Um, but I'll get into that, all of that, but this is you know, what we're going to go talk about. So what I worry about is when I want to explain you know, new forms of surveillance to my mom, you know, how do I do that? And that's why I think we need words like this. So this is my hack in a way. You know, what metaphor can politicians understand? So that's why I, I, I tried to come up with this word, like I said, I think, uh, as oil leads to global warming, I think we could make the narrative that data could lead to social cooling. Um, and I started with by building a website. It was just a, a pet project. I made socialcooling.com, and it went viral. So that was really nice. And, and then, uh, well, then I, <laughs> things exploded. Um, I'm going to talk to you about three things. The first, I'm going to talk about the rise of the reputation economy, because that's the, the core foundation of this idea. Then I'm going to talk to you about what social cooling exactly is, so what is happening in the long term in this, after this e e reputation economy comes up. And thirdly, I'm going to talk to you about what to do about it, because I don't want to leave you all depressed. Um, but it starts all with this, with this, this, this idea that a lot of us think more and more feel, which is the idea that maybe I shouldn't click on that little link. You know, you're on Facebook, you're, you're browsing, and you're, you come across this link, and you think, I could click on it, but someone might remember that, and that might look bad. Who, who here recognizes that, that feeling? See, uh, the more I give this talk, the more I, f I find people feel this, and, and it's really growing. And I think this is in the core, the, the smallest version of what I'm talking about. Uh, I call it click fear, or in, in Dutch, click phrase. Um, And this is, is you know, scientific studies point out that this is happening more and more, that a lot of people are feeling this, and that, that we see these chilling effects pop up, these effects where people stop um, clicking on things or stop doing this because they think it might harm them or it might hurt their chances. Um, and of course, this idea is, is not that strange. I mean, we all understand that if you feel you're being watched, you change your behavior. Um, and even, even the earlier, like, um, Architects like Jeremy Bentham created this idea for the panopticon, that you, the concept that you probably know, this prison, where the core idea was that the prisoners could be watched by the, uh, the, the prison masters, but they couldn't see the other way around. So you couldn't see the jailers. You couldn't see, uh, see if they were looking at you. And this meant that if you were in this prison, you constantly had this idea, am I being watched right now? Am I doing something that's illegal or not? Right? And even if you wouldn't, you might not have been watched at the moment, but you started internalizing this idea is what I'm doing right now, is that illegal? And that was the whole idea by Bentham. He said, these prisoners, even after they leave the prison, they will still have ingrained this idea of this jailer who's constantly you know, watching them. They will keep thinking, even when out of jail, is what I'm doing right now, is that okay? Is this acceptable? Um, of course, all these prisons were closed uh, because they turned out to be quite inhuman. 
Um, but in a way, this is exactly what we're building now on a societal scale, and that's because of the rise of big behavioral data and us gathering all this data about our behavior. Um, and we do this because big data has the promise of behavioral change. Right? And the most basic version that you all know is, of course, advertising. You know, ad advertisers gather data to give better ads. We all know this story, but it goes a lot further than that. I think what most people miss in this story about why our data is gathered and why advertising is, is important, it's also about risk management. Right? That's where, actually, if you look at the numbers, the bulk of the money that is made through data is not made by advertising, but it's made by risk management. People who want to manage you or citizens or consumers as a risk. Um, and if you want to see what the extreme version of this is, all you have to do is you have to go to China. Uh, in China, they're building something called the social credit system. And this is um, basically a, a score that well, says if you're a good citizen or not. It's a rating that says is the citizen well behaved or not. And this is what they say. They say, when people's behavior isn't bound by their morality, a system must be used to restrict their actions. Right? So China fundamentally doesn't really trust their citizens to make the right choice than themselves. They say, well, we'll nudge you. We'll help you to make the right decisions. The system will be based on various criteria, ranging from financial credibility and criminal record to social media behavior. And from 2020 onwards, each adult citizen should, besides his identity card, have such a credit code. So they're making this mandatory. Um, and they're wasting no time, because already you have the first version, and that's called Sesame Credit. Sesame Credit is a commercial variety made together with the uh, Alibaba group that you might know from uh, uh, AliExpress and websites like, like, like that. And already you see that, that students are in, in bars are like, you know, comparing scores, like, how's your score? You have a good score. Uh, even more impressive, already this system uh, is connected to the larger, da largest dating website in China. So if you want to date someone, you can actually look up their score and see, you know, are they paying their bills on time? Are they buying good things? Uh, this already, it's already made. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, so what you see is that are you, buying and say, are you buying and saying the right things becomes very important right, in China. Um, because getting a government job or a loan or a visa will be a lot easier if you have a good score. Right? The Chinese government doesn't want citizens with a low score to leave China because that might be you know, a bad representative. Um, but this is the thing that gets me most, because until, until now you could say, well, you know, that's your own fault. If, you, if you're a bad citizen, then you get a bad score and you get less chances. That's fair. But the thing is, it, it's, this is also a factor. So if your friend's score is bad, that, you know, that influences your score, and vice versa. If you have a bad score, you might drag your friends down. And that's where it gets really you know, insidious and where you really start thinking, who are my friends? And that's where you see the rise of things like, like data discrimination. You can talk about data stratification, where uh, certain people will cluster together. And this is one, one of my new hobbies is to, to take these really bad stock photos and then to, to do this. I'm, I'm going to do something to it, and this, this before, and now I'm going to give you the after, and, and just see how it changes. Right? That went from a nice couple to this kind of sassy, romantic love story where she wants to be with him, but he's five star and she's only a three star. Right? And in a way, this is what we're building in, or they're building in China. Um, okay, so like I'm saying, and you could be thinking, that only happens in China. Oh, those Chinese, they're so crazy. But the thing is, we're also building that. We're building the exact same thing over here, only we're calling it the reputation economy, which means we let the market build it. Um, and to give you an example, th this is a Danish startup called Deemly, and I quickly want to give you uh, a, a small uh, piece of video from uh, um, yeah, their promotional video, basically. Is there any sound, by any chance? No, I've, I've turned sounds turned on here. Well, it, it, what the video says is, uh, this is Cheryl, and she has you know, a really good score on her ride-sharing app, but she doesn't have it on another website, so what if you could connect those? Um, so then you could have one score that represents you as a person. Wouldn't that be great? And then the, the video goes on to explain that with this score, you know, wouldn't it be great if you connect it and show this score on things like, here we go, on uh, using your Deemly score on your resume to get a better job, like in China. Use it to get a bank loan, like in China. Use it on your dating profile to get you know, a better date, like in China. Right, so we see the exact same thing happening here, except the market is building it. 
And most of this whole ecosystem of all these ratings is actually invisible to us. Because right? we, we know our Uber scores and our, our Airbnb scores, we know we have those, but those are the tip of the iceberg. Most of these scores are now you know, are, are, are invisible. For example, Tinder has you know, ratings on how attractive you are. Um, you don't know about those, but they are there, and that's just an example. Um, but more and more, you see that these data brokers, which are companies specialized in gathering your, gathering your data and making these scores, um, are, are taking your data, basically, and then combining it into these scores. There are sometimes up to 8,000 scores, uh, the tally is right, right, right now. So all your data, that, that, the, the thing that people don't understand is that's your data up there, but they, those scores are their data. Um, yeah, so they're up to, or already up to 8,000. These slides are out of date. Um, and they're gathering um, scores about things like you know, your IQ, but also your psychological profile, um, sexual orientation, economic stability, just things that you might not have explicitly shared, but that their algorithms are able to deduce uh, from the patterns they see in society. Because right? someone else might have a similar profile like you, and they know that they are, or they have had, you know, this, I'm not going to go into that, but their algorithms are able to deduce this about you. Right? So up to 8,000 things about you. Um, okay, another video which we don't have the audio for, but this is about uh, a, a famous study where your Facebook um, uh, likes could be correlated to your pro uh, personality and all your, your aspects as well. Um, and uh, uh, that's just from Facebook. Like they were able to deduce really with really shockingly high uh, accuracy your gender and uh, uh, all these things. Yeah, so an like, important thing to understand is that these, what, especially in America, in Europe, in Europe it's a little bit different, but in America, you have to understand that these scores, they will always say these are our opinions about these people. They are not facts. If you say they are facts in the United States, you can get sued if it's not true. So then you get a libel case. But what they will say is our opinion. Of course, their clients will take these things as facts, so it doesn't really matter, but um, that's, that's their, how they, they do it. And so you have to understand that people say often, well, I don't want them to you know, use my data or share my data, that your data is really quite safe in a way at Facebook because they, they won't share your raw data. That, that's really not valuable. What's valuable are the um, deduced and derived and uh, scores from that, right? The, the distilled product. Those are valuable. Um, and that's no longer your data, that's their data. So that's really important to understand, a really important distinction to make. A lot of projects currently say, oh, we're going to make ways to, so you can have your own data it's kind of missing the point. Um, so in the United States, these opinions are protected as corporate free speech. So there's really nothing you can do about them in a way. Um, so what you see is that people are becoming aware of this, of that this is going on, that these ratings are being made. You see this more and more. And um, uh, what you also see is that people start to optimize their behavior. Um, so uh, like, for example, um, you know, if, if you find that Facebook is now starting to give advice on loans based on your Facebook friends, you're going to start thinking, like in China, about who are my Facebook friends. Um, you also see that these algorithms, of course, are, are rarely fair, but I'm not really going to go into it all too much, but um, yeah, this is starting to have really a big effect on us. Um, skip that. Oh, yeah, these are some examples of, of what you see happening now. So, Spotify uh, a couple of weeks ago said, what you're listening to will now be sold uh, as a live, as a, a rating about your mood. So your mood is now available to advertisers. And of course, you can go further than that. Um, this is an interesting case where um, people got physical letters in the mail about a skin condition they had. And they'd never told them, like, all they had done is go online, look up information about the skin condition. And these data brokers were able to connect these people who were searching online to their physical home address and then sold this data and this connected data. And people got physical mail. So this is already, you can forget about being anonymous online. Already there are companies now that offer you know, to give the real identity of people who are surfing. Um, this is another mind-bending video that I recommend you watch. It's about uh, psychographics. It's by a uh, a company in the, United, in the UK um, called Cambridge Analytica, and they have been very influential in getting both Trump uh, to win and getting the Brexit to, to uh, break apart. Um, this video is mind-blowing because of his honesty in saying how he uses these, these data, these scores about you, these 
subjective, you know, your psychological profile, basically, that they've gathered from you, from your online data, to influence messages to better reach you as a voter, right? So they know that if you are uh, and you're highly neurotic, and, uh, this and that, they will give you a message about gun rights, and if you're highly this and that, they will give you uh, another message. So they're very focused targeting you, micro-targeting you, based on your psychological profile to get you to vote a certain way. Um, and of course, a week after, after a week afterwards, we saw uh, that this data set was actually leaked. And again, here you see this, you know, what I was talking about, this, this, the modeled data, right? as well as data described as modeled voter behavior, ethnicities and religions was leaked. So this is about 200 million Americans, this data set got leaked, including all the psychological profile stuff. That's f scary. Um, now, when I give this talk at a tech conference, I always get the thing, oh, it's not new. We've been rating people for forever, you know, your bank always had these ratings. Um, no, it's not new, but this is deeper and, and it's everywhere, right? So now your green grocer has not just scores about your creditworthiness, but about your psychological profile. That's a whole new ballpark. Um, this market is huge, right? Some estimates said it in 2015 in the US alone, it was worth 150 billion. That's including, you know, things like Facebook and all that. But that's just to give you an example of the scale. Um, okay, um, oh, let's skip this. So in the short term, um, you could say that this, these systems in the short term do have some advantages, right? They could create trust. Right? You, you might rent your room to someone on Airbnb through the trust the system has created through these ratings. That's valuable. They might be able to reduce crime. There are long-term advantages and those are being extolled a lot. People are talking about those a lot. But um, I want to talk to you about the long-term negative effects of living in a reputation economy. Because I think those are rarely talked about. I think in general what you could say, if you want to have it summarized in a way, is that all these companies are, are interested in risk, managing you as a risk. And what you see is that this, this pressure to manage risk is kind of put on the shoulders of the consumer, of, of the citizens, who themselves will start to manage themselves as a risk. Right? I don't want to be a risk, I want a good loan, I want a good this and that, so I'll be less of a risk so that the company will accept me. And that brings us to social cooling, right? the, the, the long-term effects. I'm going to talk to you about three aspects that I think are, we will see in the long term. And I've kind of already talked about the first one, which is that we'll see a rise of a culture of self-censorship. Right? We've already seen, seen this happening with people not clicking on links that much anymore. Um, and loads of studies are pointing this out now. Um, especially the one about spring break was the one that, that really started this for me, this exploration into this, uh, this subject. Um, where people, you know, the students don't go as wild as they used to on spring break because they are being watched. Uh, the videos will go online the next day. Um, so yeah, that's fascinating. This is what, what the girl says from spring break. She says, we are very, very reserved. Um, you don't ha want to have to defend yourself later, so you don't do it. Right? So that's one of the quotes from these students who just don't party as hard anymore. Um, in, in scientific circles, this, has, this effect has been long for, known for a long time, and it's called the spiral of silence, where you don't uh, want to say something weird or fall out of the mainstream uh, ideology. So what you see here, basically, is this first point, this idea of self-censorship, is that what I find so horrifying about it is that you do have freedoms, right? you do have the freedom of expression, for example, but you don't use it, right? because you're feel the social pressure to not, to not do it, right? So that's really insidious in a way, right? That's, that's really weird. The second thing is, if you look at the first part, part was about like how if individuals react to this reputation economy, but the second thing is what this does to a society in the long term. And then you will see societal rigidity. Society will be less able to change. Um, and that's very much where we see the societal value of privacy. Because um, I think what privacy allows is for minority values to, in the long run, become majority values. And we see this time and time again in society. Um, so let's give an example. Let's look at weed here in the Netherlands. Right? In the Netherlands, weed was illegal, but then, of course, you know, some people tried it at home, and then, hey, Janine, you should try a bit of weed. It's, and then she was like, oh, well, it's not so bad. And slowly, but surely, society's opinion about these things changes you know, in the background, beneath the surface. And then after a while, people are like, you know, what are we still worried about? And then society's opinion changed, changes. And that's because privacy allows us to do things outside of the view of the controlling eyes, you know, just to explore. 
And you see, the you know, weed is interesting, but the way more important thing is, of course, what Martin Luther King uh, points out, that this is also how society changes its values about things like discrimination, about gay rights, etc. So Martin Luther King has, has a great video where, where he talks about how proud he is to be maladjusted. Um, he doesn't want to adjust to you know, the pressures of society to accept discrimination and all that. So this is a pretty you know, important thing about privacy and about feeling free to, to fight against injustices that's related to this idea. The third thing that in the long term could happen if, if we live in a society like this is that we'll create a culture of risk avoidance. And this is more of an economic argument, you could say. And I'll give you an example. Um, so there was an experiment in New York in 1995 where they started giving doctors already scores on, uh, on you know, how they were doing. And of course, if patients died under their knife, that was a negative effect, a uh, negative influence on their score. So what you found was that um, these doctors started to... The doctors who uh, operated on uh, you know, high-level cancer patients, cancer patients with advanced stage cancer, the doctors who tried to help these people they got low scores because these people relatively often died. Let's say like one in two of them died. So these doctors had low scores because they had the guts to help people. While the doctors who didn't do anything, who said, you know, sorry, I can't help you, those had high scores because people didn't die under their knife, but these people died prematurely. So you see that these systems create these perverse incentives to, to not take risks, right, to avoid risk. And of course, with, you know, uh, people like doctors and other uh, uh, professionals in our society, we would like them to take risks, right? Risk, taking risk is important, and if we create too strong incentives to not take risks, that's a problem. I see very much here a paradox of the creative industry that I'm sure we're all, you know, part of, which is that, um, sorry, this is in Dutch, but you know, being, uh, having the guts to be different was, was one of the things that research point out is really important for children to become creative. This is about a project by Teno about um, measuring a, a project how children can become more creative. That's very important now. They have to be different. They have to be, feel that it can be different. Of course, you can wonder in a system where you know, it's all about rating you and scoring you all the time, to what extent you can still feel that you can be different. Um, I want to give you a short example of, of a company that really freaks me out and that, a comp that points to all these things, and it's called Red Owl. And this is a, 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 tr a trend in the security business that really worries me. They're about securing the human layer of the enterprise, you know, about insider risk. And what they do is they, they really they gather all kinds of data about the people and about their employees in a company, including you know, third-party feeds, social, uh, social media data, email, all kinds of things. And they create this, you know, it ingests all the data sources. Uh, and then they put the pieces together and basically create these risk scores for, um, for, citizens, for employees, including you know, who's most likely to leak, for example. Um, I think that's kind of freaky. Of course, this is, this is one that really blows my mind, which is that they say, it's about people. Yes, it's about people, but not in a good way. You know, this is really crazy. Um, but this is what the market is going towards. So you see, again, this pressure, this risk, uh, risk aversion that's really dominant. Okay, so those were the three things about social cooling the aspects. The, um, you know, the rise of self-censorship, uh, the long-term ability of society to change might lessen, and we see you know, less ability to take risks, which is important as well for the economy. Um, now we get to the final part of this talk, which is you know, to not leave you all depressed, is how do we deal with this? And I think there's a couple of areas that we should quickly talk about, which is politics, the wider audience, the economy, and finally, you and me. Uh, and of course, first thing we do, we have to wake up politics. So Dutch politicians like uh, Rutte said, well, we all have to be a little bit, a little bit more normal. You know, that's something that we don't need, right? Um, so the problem here is we are becoming too transparent. Um, and some, some, uh, so, some yeah, sorry, this is in Dutch slide again, but um, you could say that it leads to a democratic def deficit, right? It's uh, uh, um, something that we don't want. And I think God, politicians have to understand that better. They have to really have to understand how, in the long run, these systems could damage democracy. And it's about a balance of power, right? Often, these algorithms that rate us are completely untransparent. We have no idea how they work. But we are, as citizens, very transparent. I think that's, uh, there's a power imbalance there that politicians really have to understand better. 
Um, luckily, there are things like the GDPR, which is a new uh, European data protection uh, regulation, that are really starting to fix this. So politicians are waking up on the European level, which is really great. Um, the second thing that we have to do, we have to educate the public. And that's one of the things that I try to do a lot. Um, so I'll give you a short example of one of the things that we did at Setup, which was uh, um, at an exhibit last year uh, we made called Devious Devices. And one of the things that we had there was a coffee machine called Taste Your Status. And this was a coffee machine that basically gave you coffee uh, based on your area code. So if you lived in a good area you code, you got really nice, normal coffee. But if you lived in a progressively worse <laughs> neighborhood, you got progressively worse, watery, watered-down coffee. It was just a small Arduino that pumped extra water in it, depending on the data. Um, and I'll, I'll give a short video about how that worked, but it's in Dutch and, and there's no sound, so that won't really work. But um, yeah, there were lines for this thing, and people really got it. And they really, it was really, for us, the best way to, to take a shortcut, the shortest way to explain that your data is increasingly influencing your life, right? That, that's the thing that people don't get. Like, the, all the things you do, the data is coming back to you. Um, so yeah, that's always fun, these people with the scores. And how many, how, what rating do you think these people have? Any idea? I'll give it. These, four, these are four-star people. They got four-star coffee. All right. I guess the core thing that I try to do here towards you know, getting to public to understand this, that for me, is, is framing it as an environmental issue. I mean, that's the thing that I think could be very useful. And that's, of course, where, where social cooling comes in. Right? So I try to explain to people that data is not a new gold. I think that's a pretty bad metaphor. I think because gold is so great, I think we need... You know, there's nothing wrong with gold. People like gold. With oil, we better understand that there are you know, downsides to it. Right? We really understand that now. We're in the middle of you know, going away from oil. We see the downsides. I think we need to start seeing the same thing with data and look at it like we're looking at oil now. Um, and it leads to you know, not, uh, not environmental uh, nature damage, but damage of our social environment, you could say. So that's, again, why I believe this, this metaphor is useful to say if oil leads to global warming, data could lead to social cooling. Um, so I created a little map, and I think if, if we look at where we are now, you know, we're, not, you know, we're only just starting with this awareness. It's, it's early days. I mean, the Snowden leaks were the start of that, but you know, people, almost nobody understands the, this connection, in my experience. Um, again, yeah, I already explained this. I think what we have to understand is the long term, this could be damaging trust. Like if, if you know, oil damages the environment, you could say that the trust is also something that's being destroyed. Um, I think the third thing we have to do after the, the politicians have to understand it and the citizens have to understand it is that we have to create markets for privacy-friendly um, products. Um, so I think, again, we could use metaphors there like, you know, biological food could turn into I, I, ecological data or something like that, right? We have to get some kind of, this is probably not a metaphor, but we have to find, again, metaphors to get people to understand they need to have good data, good services. Um, just like, you know, we started to eat biological food, we need to have that for data. So, yeah, otherwise we could end up with things like this or, or you know, this data has severe effects on your chance on the, on the labor market. Um, and finally, the, the thing that I think we have to stop doing individually is we have to stop saying that we have nothing to hide. Right? I think that's, that's most of you probably understand that as a problem. Um, and we're going to skip the big picture, which I'm, because I, I don't have any time, right, to do that. Right, okay. Um, very briefly to say is that there's a philosopher who explains that when people say they have nothing to hide, they mean against the old system of control, like police, a crime, you do, police picks you up, you go in front of a judge, you go to prison. We understand that system of control. And that's what people mean when they say I have nothing to hide. They mean that towards that system. And I understand that. But there's a new subtle system up on top of that about, you know, you perform the wrong behavior, that gets noticed, and then you get subtly influenced to perform for, for more preferable behavior. That's what the loser points to, and I think that's what's going on here. So when people say I have nothing to hide, they mean from the old system, from the police. You do have something to hide, right? So if there, anything I've learned in the past couple of years, I've been able to explain in one sentence what privacy is. Privacy is the right to be imperfect. And that's a really important you know, right to have, right? Because we're all human, so we're all important all the time. Um, I often hear nerds say, well, privacy was just a phase. We're going away from that like it's some kind of ebb and flood thing. I think that's ridiculous. I mean, if you compare it to other uh, rights that we have, you see that, right? If you say women's rights were just a phase, was there for a while, it's going to go away now, you see how silly this is to say. And of course, Edward Snowden does it even better when he says, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide 
It's no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Right? So privacy is a fundamental human right, and there's a reason for that. In conclusion, we really have to understand, uh, develop a nuanced understanding of these privacy issues and the data issues, uh, especially in all of us, politicians, my mom. Um, we have to anticipate these long-term side effects that I've been talking about. We have to anticipate social cooling. Uh, I, I hope that's an optimistic view for me. I hope that's a way, by comparing it to global warming, that also says that we can fix this, right? We are fixing global warming, we can fix the data. If we don't, we might end up with a society that's more well-behaved, but also perhaps a little bit less human. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you very much, guys, for, uh, th for being here, attending yeah. someone who is willing to stand in, coming straight from heaven. <laughs> no problem, man. Talking to us about uh, cooling of society. <laughs> Heaven's gift. Okay, we still have 14 minutes for the next lecture, but I have someone, someone who found a microphone. Are you willing to answer one question? I couldn't agree more than the, it was fantastic what you said. You're welcome. But my question is, don't they realize that we need creative people? We need people who do unexpected things. We, we need people who are out of the, uh, yeah, are, are, are across any border or, or, because they are the, the future and they have to create wealth. So yeah, if we suppress any innovation because it was not seen before, I have worked in research and it was very curious that they said, oh, this is totally new. I said, yes, that's why I'm here, yeah? Well, again, my whole point is, yes, we don't, most people don't realize that. You know, I think fear is a short-term emotion and, and creativity is a long-term emotion, you could say. It's about long-term understanding of technology and that's really something that we're, don't, we don't excel at currently and that we have to improve. Um, and of course, this is not really a story that, that you know, a lot of tech people really want to hear, right? Because they want to hear the story where their blockchain is fixing the world and everything's going to be amazing. Right? That's a Silicon Valley story, of course, that sells technology. Um, if you're going to say, well, let's be nuanced, let's also look at the negative sound effects in the long term, it's always going to be an uphill battle. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid so. Okay, guys, welcome to the semi-automated society of today. That's what it is. Thank you. See you for the next lecture in 30 minutes. Bye-bye.